I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker in this session. Um, many or most of you will know Phil Newman. He's the editor-in-chief with Longevity Technology. <laughs> yeah, that, that sums up the response you should get. Um, Phil is a superstar, and he'll talk to you now. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Cheers. OK, hi, everybody. How are you doing? So Strengthening Outreach is the, uh, the name of this, uh, this session. And I thought I'd do something different to last year, because obviously, you know, you have your standard slides that you do over your conferences. And I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll do something a little bit different. And um, uh, hence the name of my talk, which is Weird Dreams and uh, Longevity Marketing. Because uh, I, I end up having these um, quite uh, surreal dreams. And um, they're always deadline-based. So um, last Monday, not this Monday, last week, I was on vacation, and I had a really weird dream. And um, I thought what I'd do is I'd actually share the dream with you. So I'm delighted to say that hopefully I'm still the first person to do a, uh, a dream sequence opening to their, uh, their slide talk. And um, basically, uh, my team sent me off to do the uh, interviews with various people, and I end up sort of having the, sort of the, the bigger hitters. And in this dream, this is not a real thing, in the dream, uh, they sent me off to this lighthouse. And uh, I was interviewing somebody at this lighthouse, and um, I got to the top of the lighthouse, and I wasn't really sure who the person was that I was interviewing. And um, as I got closer and the lights and everything were uh, sort of not in my eyes anymore, it turned out that actually it was Donald Trump that I was going to be uh, interviewing. And you might wonder why, you know, a little organization like us uh, is interviewing Donald Trump. Well, it turns out, and this is just a dream, that Donald Trump has a biological age of 59. And uh, it turned out that, of course, you know, Donald Trump loves the fact that he's you know, biologically younger. And he was throwing it down to uh, Joe Biden and the Democrats to you know, get his biological test done. And of course, they're saying that biological tests aren't valid. And of course, it all, it all went on. And of course, as, as we all do with these dreams, something moved on quite quickly. And then I, I ended up thinking about this album. Now, why I started thinking about this album, I have no idea. Some of you may know it. This is uh, Fat Boy Slim. Um, and in, in the sort of process I was going through that night, I was thinking, what, what year was that that, that came out? Was it sort of mid-80s or mid-90s or, or whatever, whatever it may be? Well, it turns out it was 1998 that it came out. And of course, um, the guy who is behind Fat Boy Slim, um, it was being ironic with the, uh, the album cover. Basically, you look, you know, sort of saying, as you can see what's, what's on the guy's T-shirt. Um, but I was thinking, well, actually, what, what, in 1998, what was the obesity figure looking like at that point in time, specifically in the, uh, in the UK? And you can see that, actually, it wasn't sort of a zero, but it was quite an interesting trigger point that from that album, actually, obesity uh, started going, going off the scale. Again, this is still a dream, right? So uh, um, that there, is a, there is a method behind all of this. So then I, then, um, I was reminded of an, of an old joke. Uh, and this, this old joke is, uh, what, what do you call somebody who hangs around with musicians? And the answer to that joke is it's a drummer. And uh, I started thinking about Ringo Starr. And then I started thinking about other drummers, bit of a bit of an old rocker. So I was thinking about John Bonham and uh, um, you know, other great drummers. And I, th I thought, well, actually, these two are dead. And then in my dream, I, I thought of Animal from the Muppets, right? So it's all this. It's kind of like it, as it goes, you know, these things start to uh, to start to make sense. So this is this is actually the uh, the hallway in in my home, and with, these are all pictures of our uh, you know relatives through the years. Um, you know, 10 to 30 percent of my, you know, my uh, longevity, my genes, is uh, laid out on that wall there. And um, there's a picture on the wall of this uh, 1980s uh, rock band uh, who weren't very successful, I have to say. And um, there's a picture of uh, me uh, with hair um, hanging around with musicians. And I guess that my personality hasn't really changed very much from, from the 80s, because effectively what I am now is I'm, you know, I'm kind of like a drummer hanging around a musicians, but I'm now uh, a marketing guy hanging around with lots of very talented scientists and, uh, uh, and, and CEOs. And I guess that I've kind of put myself into this position where um, you know, my organization is, uh, is, is part of the industry. And we have some views of the industry. Anyway, I woke up from my dream, 
And I explained to my wife about, you know, Donald Trump, Fatboy Slim, and Ringo Starr. And I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my, my session at the conference uh, about all of this. And her encouraging words were, well, good luck with that one. So anyway, there we go. So um, in terms of... Um, uh, outreach and, and marketing. I mean, obviously, the, a lot of the content up until now has been, you know, extremely scientific. And this quote from Fred Wilson, who is a uh, leading VC, um, it's quite a long time ago now that he made this quote. I, I found this like a really interesting quote because sometimes I agree with it and sometimes I don't agree with it. Um, but basically, the point he was making that if, if the product's good enough, then it's going to sell itself and you don't need marketing. Um, so, anyway. Let's talk about marketing. So, so when you think about marketing in the context of any industry or any product, um, there are three elements to it. There's, there's product marketing, which is uh, the quality of your products, what the market needs from your products, what your competitors are doing, you know, understanding how your product fits into the market, and it does apply to services as well. Uh, then you've got strategic marketing, which is sort of the heavy lifting of things like lobbying um, or creating awareness uh, at a much larger scale, big strategic scale. And then you've got marketing communications, which is obviously the element of regular communications that sit behind that. And of course, you know, marketing is a very important part of strengthening the, the outreach of the industry out to uh, its potential customers, whether those customers are governments or, or individuals themselves. And um, unfortunately, my M has dropped off there, but this is a bit of marketing theory. I don't know if anybody's heard of uh, chasm theory, uh, but this is, this is uh, Jeffrey Moore's uh, book, Crossing the Chasm. And what happens is, as you can see, you go from innovators through to early adopters as a market starts to grow. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of markets get over the chasm, um, and some companies and, and uh, markets themselves get over that chasm, and sometimes they can slip back, you know, because there's, there's maybe something more disruptive has come in. Um, and some companies and, and markets don't actually get across the chasm. And then this other one, uh, which Eleanor mentioned uh, from Vita Dow, which is the uh, Gartner hype cycle, which is where you've got the original point of innovation, the technology trigger, the peak of inflated expectations through to the trough of delusionment, and, uh, and away you go. But the, the interesting thing is, is actually the, the two correlate. Uh, so the hype chasm model is something that I've just made up. It doesn't really exist. But you can see the concept of where you've got uh, a market developing, and there are risks associated with that market. So when you think about uh, the work that anybody's doing in this space, you might be at the sort of very, very early stages doing something like cellular reprogramming. You might be at the sort of peak at this stage, or you might be on the way down to the trough. You may have had a uh, phase two um, uh, failure. Um, and yeah, you, know, you, you can appreciate that it's, of course, different parts of the industry are all, all at different parts of the scale. And as you can see here, this is, this is my guess of where we are really with uh, longevity in terms of its um, uh, a point to being completely infl inflated of all expectations. And um, you can see that what's happening in the marketplace, obviously you've got uh, Brian Johnson, um, who is actually a really, really smart and very nice guy. You're going to be speaking or hearing from him tomorrow. Obviously, he's a public experiment now on longevity. And you've even got Kim Kardashian now uh, out there doing full body MRI, and that's started to sort of get, get some messaging out there in relation to preventative medicine. So it is starting to happen out there. And um, bringing back to, to Donald Trump and him being biologically 59, um, one of the things that I think is massively important for this industry, with all the great work that's going on, is that we need to have a very, very reliable uh, biological age test that everybody sits, stands behind. And of course, you've got the, the sort of 1.0 was the work that Steve Horvath did. Uh, you've got 2.0, which is where you've got quite a number of epigenetic players in the marketplace. Um, I was very lucky to be invited to a preview of really quite a game changer now uh, in epigenetic testing that's going to be coming out in about six weeks' time. And of course, as uh, Evelyn Bishop was talking about, there are other markers as well. It's not just about epigenetic testing. There's lots of other variations out there. And what's going to happen, of course, is that over a period of time, especially when the medical community start to get involved much more actively, which I know is going to be happening, uh, Buck Institute's got a big program on this, and they're going to be doing work in, in December on this, we're going to get to a point where there is a 
industry consensus on me ma measuring and managing biological age, which we're not at yet, we're at 2.0, we'll get to 5.0 over a period of time. And when we're there, that to me is really where the industry is going to, uh, to really change. So then, um, you know, back to sort of fat boy slim, right? So, so there's a, again, there's a correlation here. Um, a lot of people talk about, you know, when will the FDA um, recognize aging as a disease? Um, uh, Ricardo made a, a very important point on in his in silico presentation on uh, the first day, which was when a drug gets through, it will be a longevity drug because at the end of the day, it's going to be focused on one of the diseases of aging. So I'm not fixated, as, as I'm sure some of you aren't either, on the FDA actually classifying um, long aging as a disease because you know, the aging diseases themselves cost an awful lot. And of course, the pathways that a lot of you are working on scientifically, at the end of the day, are going to fix either one of or multiple of these aging diseases. And I was um, uh, brushing my teeth about, about two, two months ago, I think maybe six weeks ago. And I was listening to the radio, as you do, and there was a, uh, a government spokesman, a UK government spokesman, talking about uh, this new drug, the, the skinny jab, which, um, as many of you may be aware, this is focused on diabetes, but actually it is a, uh, it's a, it's a drug that helps people uh, lose weight. So being overweight, obviously, in my opinion, is not a disease. Obviously, diabetes is a disease. But effectively, what you've got is you've got a kind of lifestyle um, uh, drug now that's starting to permeate into the market. And the thing that actually really shocked me, and I found it fascinating, is that the government spokesman was saying they're going to give this to millions of people in the UK. Not just like a, you know, a few thousand as a kind of extreme, but they're going to give it to millions of people. And I was really fascinated by that, because that, to me, is really a sort of precursor as to where we're going to be in the future. And if you just take a look there, this is just a sort of scrape from the FT website. You can see that all the headlines there, this is just August, right, uh, relating to the skinny jab. Um, what it's done to uh, Nova Nordisk's share price, you can see it's kind of giving it a really nice boost, boost there. And the key thing is, is when you look at some of those headlines that came off of the, uh, the FT website, Fast forward a few years, what, that's, what is that going to look like in the context of longevity? Um, we're actually going to be doing some research to start to really get to the point where we can get a feel for when, when we're going to get there with, a, uh, with some form of uh, treatment, whether it's a pill, an injection, an infusion, or whatever it may be. But when we get to that point, you can see that whether, whether it's a skinny jab or it's going to be uh, some form of uh, longevity drug, you can see the context of how that's going to change. So going back to that, that hype, hype cycle, when we get to that hype cycle, it's going gonna, it's gonna to explode. And we all know it's going to explode. The question that we're now working on is, uh, is when is it going to explode? Interestingly, I, I was speaking with uh, Juvenescence's chairman, Greg Bailey, and um, we were talking about uh, where the first market will be for, for longevity therapies. And I, I was saying that you know, I'm a Brit, and I, you know, I, actually our market is America, and I actually think that the UK is going to be one of, the, one of the first places where we'll see a rollout of, uh, of aging therapies. And, and Greg Bailey thinks we're going to see it in the GCC, which is the, is the Middle East area. And that's kind of counter to, of course, the fact that, as you can see here, these, the blue circle, part of the pie chart there, is where all of the longevity companies are. So most of the longevity companies and most, most of the research is in America. It might well be that the first market isn't America because, of course, of the, the constructs of the, uh, of the medical system. So the third part, um, back to sort of my, my, my domain, is, is really in, in communications. And, and as a marketing guy, uh, back in the, in the sort of middle part of uh, the last, last decade, I was looking for an industry to throw myself into. Um, I've been in lots of different industries, and um, I read about longevity um, just as a, as a, in an article. I thought, this is really, really interesting. And that was back in 2018. I read uh, uh, the MIT uh, interview with Aubrey. I read uh, Jim Mellon's book. Started to do some work and realized that actually what I felt at that time was that this industry is going to be the equivalent of what banking tech was before fintech happened. And we all know what's happened with fintech since then. So we, we, get, we got started. We, we started in 2019. 
And since 2019, we've migrated from being just a, uh, um, a, a business uh, news website. We're not obviously um, um, a, a research publication. We, we, we cover the industry itself in terms of funding and new discoveries and that type of thing. Uh, we migrated then to developing uh, much more activity with the investment community. So we have a database of um, many, many investors uh, that we now present uh, investment deals to that are, that are longevity deals. And we've now moved very actively into consumer education because there's a massive appetite out there. And really, longevity, um, uh, Tobias was uh, talking about sort of low-hanging fruit. As we know, the supplements industry and what will happen with the clinical part of longevity is moving very fast. And there's a lot of appetite out there. So we're, we're working with consumers. So um, we've been working hard at it since we launched in September 2019. Um, we had a massive milestone um, last month. So in July, we hit uh, 1.25 million unique users on our website in that, in that one month, which was phenomenal. You know, it was a big surprise to us. We've been working hard to make that happen. So we're on track now to sort of grow our, grow our platform. As you can see, we're expecting to get to 5 million users. And obviously, that's part of this, uh, this outreach program. Um, very interestingly for us is that um, the two bars, the orange bars there, indicate that really it's the sort of millennial generation are the ones that are our most active readers. And it's great that there's this you know, beautiful gender split right down the middle. Uh, our market is the USA, because that's just really where the, uh, the market is happening. And uh, what we did uh, as part of our work as a, as a media company was actually try to measure and identify the size of the industry. So we, we actually defined uh, 25 different domains of longevity. You, you can see them there. And what we've done is we've integrated those into a, into a, into a model. So, so that model basically is what we consider to be the, uh, the map of the longevity industry. Um, we might be adding another slice in there, which will be longevity fintech, because that's something that's really starting to emerge now. Um, but the key thing is, is now we've got the, the identification of the sectors, and because of the work we're doing with the investment side of the industry, we can start to count how much uh, capital is going into the industry. So you can see that 2021 was the standout year. Um, 2022 wasn't too far behind that, but three billion of that was made up by Altos. You can all imagine what 2023 looks like. It's been a horrible year in terms of uh, equity investment. We've identified that only uh, 40 longevity companies have had any equity funding this year. So what it gives us the ability to do is to say, to understand how the industry is growing, you know, how the, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of sectors of the industry are starting to move around. Um, you know, you can see that there's longevity clinics is in there, and that's a big focus for us. We think that's a really, really important part of the, of the industry, which we're now starting to focus on. And the, key, the nice thing is, is now that we've got that data, we've started to be recognized as industry analysts for the longevity market. So uh, over this last year, we've been um, quoted in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and so on, because people are they're, they're now interested in longevity, because longevity is starting to get onto their radars, and they want to know how big the industry is, who the players are, what the issues are, and so forth. So uh, we've, we're doing a lot of work with the Wall Street Journal at the moment. They, 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 they really like what's, uh, what's happening, and they're very, very interested in, obviously, the likes of what Kim Kardashian's doing and what Brian Johnson is doing, that gets on their radar. So then, obviously, that then helps the whole industry and the awareness of the industry grow. So um, our mission is, is part of strengthening outreach. Um, we are a commercial organization. We, we, we generate money. Um, we're raising capital at the moment uh, to continue with the work that we're doing. We will absolutely be continuing to do what we do on the industry side, interviewing people, understanding the dynamics of what's happening in the industry. We're also actually going to be doubling down on the investment brokerage side of our business because, you know, ultimately it's going to come back. We know it's going to come back, um, but you know, it's not happening for a while. And I don't think actually for probably another year that we're going to see any great correction in terms of uh, investment activity. So we're moving more actively into helping consumers understand about longevity. Really trying very very hard to uh, avoid uh, hype and really giving people guidance on, on the right things. And as it says on the bottom there, we just, um, we just launched two days ago uh, our clinical survey. So if you are involved in the, uh, the clinical side of longevity, please go to our website uh, and help us complete that survey so we can get a picture of, uh, of what's happening within the industry.
So as a, uh, as a former drummer, um, now a, a marketing guy, uh, thanks very much for, uh, for your time today. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, we take one question? Oh, yeah, sure. So make sure you have a good one. <laughs> Hi, Phil. Wonderful talk. Great the work you're doing in education. I did notice in your chart of which sectors had the most investment. So yes. reprogramming was at the highest. The very lowest was the sector of longevity education. Do you think there should be more investment in longevity education? Uh, absolutely, and I think that that, that really starts at, um, at med school. Um, because I think that there is, uh, obviously there's a, a retrospective in industry, uh, Evelyn talked about it yesterday, the stuff that she's doing with longevity degree, that's helping to educate the, the marketplace, uh, but people are coming out of med school with, with very little knowledge about l uh, longevity and uh, uh, the industry that they're now moving into and being part of, so I think it's a very, very important part, and it's not big enough by any means at the moment. And, and the reason we're doing the survey is to truly understand um, are there people that are claiming to be longevity practitioners that actually aren't clinically trained to be longevity practitioners? Because I think that's going to be a, an issue that we're going to lean into as a, as a whole sector at some point. So, thanks, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, guys.